Okay, um, so uh, we talked so far uh, about, you know, if you have yourself a, a cat zero cube complex, you can look at the collection of, of half spaces and you get yourself Okay, so these are the, the half spaces. And we saw that this was a nice host set with an involution. It was nice and discreet, so on, right? And then uh, we talked about how if you start with uh, such a POC set, then you can build uh, a CAT0 uh, cube complex, right, from, from this. Right, you started with sigma and you built something up. Um, and there's this uh, slogan which goes under, slogan is roll, roller duality, which is that uh, these constructions um, are uh, inverses of one another. So if you, if you started with, so this is something uh, Roller did in, in, I don't know when this was, the late 90s even, that if you start with a cat zero cube complex and you look at the half spaces and then you, you look at this pox set over here and you build your cube complex, you'll get your, your cat zero cube complex back. And uh, same thing in the other direction. If you take a pox set, and you build a cat zero cube complex, and then you look at the half spaces, you, you get back the pox set that you, that you started with. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is useful for various things. Um, one of them is, so this is sort of an application, is uh, recognizing uh, products. So, so if you, you think about a, a product of, you know, uh, X is Y cross Z, right, two cat zero cube complexes, like think of your favorite thing, say a tree cross a tree. Okay, so this is a tree cross a tree. Then what do the hyperplanes in here look like? You know, the, the hyperplanes inside of, so. What do the hyperplanes in X, X look like? Well, they're just going to be pre-images under the projection. So there's natural projection, so they're pre-images of hyperplanes in Y and Z, okay, uh, under, the, under the projections. Right, so you have a nice projection map from X to Y and from X to Z and you pull back. So, you know, you think of taking a hyperplane here, well, what's a hyperplane in a tree? In this case, it's just a point. Right, and you take its pre-image and you'll get some tree here. And the same the other way around. So, you know, let's, let's call those, uh, you know, H, the hyperplanes in here is HY and HZ. So that's what all the hyperplanes in, in H look like. But notice moreover, that what's true of these, these hyperplanes, the ones in Y and the ones, take one in Y and one in Z, well, what goes on with them is that they all intersect. Okay, so you should convince yourself of that. They all intersect. So this is a transverse 
uh, we'll call this a transverse decomposition of the hyperplanes. Okay, so, so that's what happens. You, you get a, a decomposition of the hyperplanes into this joint union of two families of hyperplanes such that every hyperplane here crosses every hyperplane here. Okay, so if you think about this uh, duality thing a little bit, right, that you go back and forth, it, it gives the same thing. You can, in other words, you can recognize from a pox set, you can recognize this kind of thing. So if I gave you a cat zero cube complex, so if X was a cat zero cube complex um, and H decomposed as H hat was decomposed as this transverse, so transverse decomposition, okay, then, then X would just be X that you would get from H1. You just build the cube complex associated to H1, and you take cube complex associated to H2, and you take their product, and it will have the same structure as this, right? So that means it has, this thing has to be the same cube complex as X, because it, it's hyperplanes have the exact same, the half spaces associated, the hyperplanes have the exact same poxet structure. So you can, you can look at the hyperplanes and see, you, you missed, I'm answering your question. Okay? So, uh, the slogan is, is this roller duality, that if you take a cube complex and you look at the half spaces, and then from this you build a cube complex, you're going to get X back. Okay, and the same, if you take a pox set, you build a cube complex, and you look at the pox set, you get the pox set back. So uh, this was in, in Roller's, uh, so he has this, it's, what's the word, is it habilitation? Habilitation, whatever. So he, uh, the, this was something that, a very long thing that I don't think it was ever published. Uh, um, where he, he looked at very formally a lot of the, the things having to do with cat zero cube complexes. And, and this is just a little piece of it that um, I've, I've sort of found useful. Um, so, so you can see the, the, the product by looking at just the hyperplanes and seeing when you can break them up into a disjoint union such that every hyperplane in one crosses every hyperplane in another. Okay, and that's what you see when you, when you take a product. And in fact, if you saw this, well, you just build the cube complex associated to H1 and the cube complex associated to H2, and well, that has the same pox set structure as H, so the cube complex you would get would be, would be X. So whenever you see such a thing, that's, uh, okay, so you, you should, uh, if you think about this even, think about this a uh, little bit more, um, you'll see that uh, if X is finite dimensional, then um, there exists a canonical product decomposition. Okay, so this is something that uh, uh, Capras and I noticed when we were working on, on rank rigidity, that you, you simply get, there's, you give me any X, then you can break it up into factors, okay, such that each of these are indecomposable. So, uh, if you if you think about this, take the so take the 
collection of all hyperplanes, right, and take their incidence graph. So that means, you know, take a point for each hyperplane and join them by an edge whenever they cross, right? So what you want to be thinking about is a complementary graph of that. I always get a headache when I think of complementary graphs, but complementary graph of that and take its connected components. So every graph can be broken up into connected components. So those components of the complementary graph of the incidence graph of the hyperplanes gives you this decomposition. So it's kind of like you take a graph, you want to look at it as a, as a join. Well, how there's a join decomposition, and that's the same as the Oh, there you go. So thank you for that. That's the, uh, right. So what happens in that case, that's the, now that we've sort of thought about this a little bit, um, yeah, before I do that, let me just, okay, well, I'll come back to this. So, uh, so let's go back to the, the, the homework you had, right? In the, in, we had these, families of, right, three families of, of lines. Well, what happens in that case? What? Can you, in terms of this kind of uh, decomposition of the, the hyperplanes, right, well, what do you see? Each, each line of a different slope crosses every line of a different slope, right? So this breaks up this decomposition to three things, right? And what about for each one of them, what's the cube complex associated to each one of them? Each, for each parallelism class of lines, what's the cube complex associated to? Hmm? That's a universal symbol for R, right? The real line, right? For every one of these, you just... Here are the vertices, and then they're joined by edges. When they differ by one, so you just get the real line. So this cube complex that, you, that you've got here is just R3. It's just the standard... of R3. Okay, and this picture that you're looking at, okay, that this typically will be some sort of, if you think of the cubulation of R3, R3 and think of a, of a plane that's um, crossing all of the hyperplanes in there, then we'll see three families of lines, right? So that's kind of what you're looking at when you, when you see this. Okay, so that's uh, this a this this kind of phenomenon is interesting in the sense that if you had this kind of a situation and you built a cube complex, so let's say you had an action over here. Let's say you had the z squared acting co-compactly. Well, you won't get a co-compact action on the cube complex in this case. Okay, and that's something that does come up, and it comes up whenever you have Euclidean kinds of pictures not hyperbolic pictures, but Euclidean pictures, um, when you're building things with walls like this, you know, spaces with walls, you'll get big triangles, and big triangles give rise to cubes, um, give rise to not co-compact actions. Okay, so this is a, a useful, useful thing. It's, it's, once you get these factors down, uh, it turns out that um, so this is stuff with compressed, I'm not again. I'm not going to belabor it, but you can, if you're if you're interested, you you actually get it down to uh, a product of factors um, of a Euclidean factor, so something that has an odd x invariant flat. So this this will look like a Rn, and then 
a bunch of other cube complexes, and these will be uh, rank one. So there will, when, when you have a group acting properly and co-compactly here, you'll have rank one elements inside of each one of these things. So um, anyway, I, I won't go in that that direction today, but uh, that's a whole other story that one can uh, one can discuss. And again, this has a lot to do with the structure of the hyperplanes and group groups acting in hyperplanes. Um, so uh, it's just, if you have an axis, then it doesn't bound a half flat, the usual definition in a cat zero space. Um, they're actually contracting in the usual way. They have north-south dynamics. Um, they're, they behave like hyperbolic elements in hyperbolic space. And there are other, yeah, anyway, I won't, I won't go in. Uh, this? Well, there's a lot to say here, so I'm trying to not say too much. So you assume that X has a co-compact action, a co-compact automorphism group, and that it's essential, so all the hyperplanes separate into two components, uh, two unbounded components. And then, um, then it's got this decomposition into factors where one of them is, is Euclidean, and Euclidean means that it has an odd E invariant flat inside of it. So it's uh, quasi-symmetric to a Euclidean plane. So anything acting over here will just be some abelian group. And all the other factors um, are rank one in the sense that any group acting properly co-compactly here okay, will have rank one elements. They will have elements with contracting elements, with north-south dynamics. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there's a whole, a whole story to tell here um, about uh, finding, you know, you want to find hyperplane patterns that look like this. Right, and you want to find group elements that do this, for example, and then you get free groups. There's a whole sort of story over here, and I'm not, that's a that story I'm not going to tell today. Because I had orders to do other things. So, uh, right, so that's one use of this, uh, one use of this um, construction is that you can just stay in the world of cat zero cube complexes and and get learn new things about it. Um, the the other thing is uh, cubulating cubulating groups, which this has seen a lot of action over the last few years. Um, so you know you 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 take your take your group and you take some I don't know, presentation two complex for it or some space that the group acts on. Right, so you take G and I'll give it a different name, I don't know, K. So this is some space on which G acts uh, properly and co-compactly. So usually you're dealing with, say, a finitely presented group, but you might not, and then you may drop this, go compact if you want. And you start looking for an equivariant family of walls, okay? Uh, and to turn it into a space with walls with a group action. So you look for walls. Okay, and you, and you want it to be equivariantly. Right, so if I give you, I don't know, the uh, hyperbolic three space, it's not enough to just find planes in there, right? You want a group action, otherwise you haven't really learned anything. So, um, so this, this equivariant issue is kind of important. Um, so, so one example of where this was done, so uh, was small cancellation groups.
Okay, so this, uh, so this was, this was wise uh, quite a few years back already. So um, a small cancellation group is, people know about small cancellation groups or is that not? I mean, um, roughly speaking, you have, you think of a typical presentation for a group. So typical whatever that might mean, right? That's very kind of a random, you know, random group you could think of. Well, you'd have, you know, some generating set, and then your relations would typically be very long, you know, like the Anna Karenina written around the boundary of a disk, right? So if you think of two relations, odds are that they're not going to have parts of them that are the same unless the two books were one was plagiarizing the other, you're not going to find in little pieces of R1 and R2, right? You know, big pieces anyway, that are the same. So when you look in, in the universal cover, and you, so you build now, this will be a presentation two complex. What you're going to see is some relations, and then they'll they may, they'll intersect, but along their boundary, but, you know, these disks will intersect in very small pieces relative to the size of the disks, right? So that's, that's what's called a small cancellation condition. So, I can't even, you know, draw this, but you're sort of meant to imagine a, a, a two-dimensional complex where the, the disks are very large and, and where they meet, it's, any two of them meet is very small. Yeah, connected components of intersections. And yeah, in fact, they will yeah, typically intersect in connected things in the universal cover, typically. Um, so what's going to happen, um, so what you do is very naive kind of thing, is that you imagine this is a, this is a polygon and subdivide so that each disk um, has an even number of sides. Okay, that doesn't seem like much. And then Then what you do, you, well, what's the, one way to build a wall is to just go from, pick an arc that goes from one side to the other side of the disk, all the way across. It's an even number of sides, so you go from the middle of one edge, so you think of this as, let me draw it again here, so there's an edge and an opposite edge, these are opposite edges and you take an arc that runs all the way across and then you continue into all the neighboring cells okay so there may be lots of neighboring cells over here well whenever there is one you just go across to the other side so you just go in every disk you go to every disk and you take all of these lines that go from one side to the other. Okay. And so every one of these, these things sort of, every time it hits an edge, there will be a hundred cells coming in there. You just go off in all directions and you go to the opposite side. And then you continue always in this way. Now, these things, this, these small cancellation groups, this are, are hyperbolic. These are hyperbolic groups. They're hyperbolic groups. What? Yeah, so subdivide so that each disk has an even number of sides. Right? So you, you, first, you first do that doesn't change things very much. It can, it can create a situation where you have walls that are close to one another for a little bit, but 
Um, so, so these are hyperbolic groups, and, and that kind of hyperbolicity that comes up in small cancellation groups um, will tell you that you, this, these, can, these walls can never come back and cross themselves. Okay, so this re requires proof. I mean, this is a pretty long paper. It's pretty you know, technical. But intuitively, you can think that whenever you have these uh, small cancellation conditions, you, you can't go around and come back. Okay, and there's, uh, anyway, you, you, should, you should learn a little bit about this. There's something called Greenlinger's Lemma, which is used over and over, over here, which has to do with, uh, if you've learned about Dane's algorithm and things like that, that like, same idea comes up there. And it tells you that this, these, these walls are embedded Okay, inside of this, this complex, and then it will fill it all up. So that's another thing that one has to, to check when you go and you build. So, you, so these are walls. That's the first thing that you have to check, and that's something to do with the fact that you're bifurcating and going in every direction whenever you meet an edge. The other thing is that they're nice and embedded, so you get these nice walls that separate the space. Okay, so you get a nice space with walls. And then they have this property that they're, they're filling. So the, the regions between such things are compact. Okay, so if you think of looking at complementary regions of these things, of all of these walls, they'll be, they'll be compact. So anyway, you build uh, a cat zero complex, okay, and the, this this complex will be finite dimensional, and that goes back to what I was saying yesterday. So yesterday I was talking about curves on surfaces. When you lift it up, you'll get a, a finite dimensional cube complex in that setting, and it's the same thing here. So these are quasi-convex subgroups of of hyperbolic groups. Okay, and they have something called finite width. So that's something that uh, Mahan and I thought about many, many years ago. Um, so this will be true whenever you have a quasi-convex subgroup in a hyperbolic group, and you, and it's co-dimension one. So you can, you you have these walls, and you build a cube complex associated to it. It will always be finite dimensional, and the action. is uh, co-compact. So you get a nice, proper uh, co-compact action on a, on a cat zero cube complex just by looking at these walls. Okay, so I'm definitely not, not going to go into all the details of this. Um, there's, it, it's a very technical paper, but the, I want you to just sort of see the, the sketch of it. Yeah, you, you want to get a group to act on a cat zero cube complex. Well, one thing that I talked about at the beginning was you just try to chop it up into little cubes. Well, that's hard. It's easier to just try to build, build walls, find your family of walls somehow, and then prove everything you can possibly prove about that family of walls. So, for example, first, you know, first you have to prove that they're walls, and then you have to prove, uh, that the action is co-compact. Well, that will turn out to say something about how much this fills the space up. And then you want to know uh, that it's, excuse me, uh, properness that tells you that. Um, and then you want to think about things like co-compactness and finite dimensionality and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so every one of these, you're, yeah, that's right, every one of these, if it's two n sides, and I've got n guys coming through, that'll give you an n cube, an n-dimensional cube. Yeah, this will be a high-dimensional cube. That's right. And this, this you can already see when you think about curves on surfaces. If you think of a very complicated curve on a surface, and you lift it to the universal cover, you'll get families of lines that pairwise intersect. And when you do, you get yourself, right, you get yourself a cube, an n cube. 
and you get that here. So you build a uh, proper co-compact action on something that's very high dimensional, but maybe you don't care about that. It sort of allows you to organize other things. You know, you get hyperplanes, you get, yeah. Yeah. Torsion, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I haven't thought about this in quite a few years. I don't remember if there were, if the assumption was that it was torsion free or not. Um, but morally speaking, it shouldn't. I mean, you know, uh, it'll, they'll just be finitely many of conjugacy classes of those things, and they tend to not interfere very much in these kinds of constructions. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to. Say that was too much assuredness, because, but I, yeah. Anyway, and the, there are particulars of the small cancellation conditions that I'm definitely not going to get into. This is what's called C prime one six, whatever that is, um, and so and and in fact he proved it for various uh, proved slightly weaker theorem for somewhat weaker conditions and so on. But um, that's. You know, once you get into it, you can you can get into a lot of technical details. But the, that's what I want you to get out of this: is you just look for ways to build walls. And in this case, it's it's kind of obvious what you want to do. Okay, there's afterwards you have to do work. Yeah. Well, what can go wrong is, for starters, these things can come back and cross themselves. Okay, it's. So then it will, you can, you can, for example, in this kind of a situation where you, you branched off in all possible directions, you could end up having one of these, these things are called tracks, where you, you have some two dimensional cell and you draw an arc and you hit an edge and you continue drawing arcs, that's called a track. And if your track could, you could end up having just one of them, you could just fill up your whole space. So. So small cancellation is a, a negative curvature condition. You can think about it the following way. This is not turning very much. So if I draw in the hyperbolic plane, I have a poly, you, you, this is sort of the typical thing you do in hyperbolic. If you have, I draw an arc, which is built from pieces of a certain fixed length, and I turn almost 180 degrees, and I keep going, I'll never close up, right, in a hyperbolic space. In Euclidean space, you close up. And it's that same kind of idea that in order for this to go back and cross itself and to not be quasi-isometrically embedded, you would have to turn a lot. And here you don't, you're not turning a lot, right? If this is a thousand sides and you're going straight across, then it's not turning a lot. So this thing is a nice quasi-isometrically embedded wall. It's not just embedded. Okay, so then you'll, if you go off in this direction, you'll get very far away from this wall. You go off in that direction, you'll get very far away from it. Okay, so that's a very intuitive uh, idea. But, uh, so, you know, sometimes, yeah, you're right. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you have to know, you know, try to, in each situation, it's, you know, so people have tried this in other situations and they, they failed precisely because they didn't have enough negative curvature. And so that, so that uh, there exists a, say that again? So that this, so that not every group is small cancellation. So which property? So you mean that you can build a wall in this way? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Um, so say it again, if you have a group, you have a group that was cubulated well, you, you, can, you can build tracks like this, yeah. So, I mean, you can, uh, so if you had, so you take any uh, 
k is a, this is a presentation too complex and you you look at its universal cover so this is the universal cover of k um, and g was also acting on a cat zero cube complex so you had a cat zero cube complex then you could map this to here this is a nice contractible space so you can take every Imagine that this is triangulated. Okay, so take your cells and triangulate them. So take every vertex and and map the vertices into your into vertices of your cube complex in some g equivariant way, and then extend it over the cells. Then you can make everything transverse to the hyperplanes. You can make this map. You can make this map from here. To here transverse to the hyperplanes. Okay, so here are the hyperplanes here. And what I mean by transverse that whenever it's crossing, whenever a two cell, let's say a simplex crosses this, it crosses it in a transverse way. So then the pre-image of the hyperplanes gives you some kind of a picture like that. So there will be these tracks that are pullbacks of hyperplanes in any presentation two complex. That's true. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's something that has been used a lot in uh, various people's work. Um, yeah, I don't know. there's a lot to say there also. Uh, okay. Um, right. So that's one uh, application of, of cubulation. Um, the, the other thing, am I allowed to write here? I keep writing here, but I don't know. Um, so that's small cancellation is one example. The other example that I wanted to tell you about was hyperbolic three manifolds because that relates to other things that are going on. So, um, so whenever you have uh, an immersed incompressible surface in a three manifold, you have here's M3, and this is a hyperbolic three manifold. Okay, and you had some surface and it's mapped into here in some pi one injective way. This is a this is a surface. Everything's compact and closed. Okay, well, again, this is very similar to what we saw in dimension two. You're going to have hyperbolic three space, and, and the surfaces will lift to topological planes. If you, it can be arranged so that the surfaces here will be topological planes. And if this is a quasi Fuchsian surface, Right, then this, this, you know, you get some kind of quasi circle in the limit set, right? And so this gives you a wall. So these are walls for the group G, which is pi one of the three manifold, right? In fact, so any, any, anytime you have a pi one objective surface into these, into a three manifold, you're going to get that. Okay, but here you actually got that it's a nice quasi-convex subgroup. Okay, so there was um, this big theorem of Kahn and Markovich, which is that there exist lots of these. Okay, um, that was a question that was open for a long time. I mean, I, I was certainly interested in this question when I was a little kid. Um, and so um, they show that for any pair of points in the boundary, you can find a quasi Fuchsian surface such that the limit set separates the two points in the boundary. So that was, there are lots of these walls running around. And so then, uh,
So then uh, Bergeron and Wise, they, uh, they use this to sh so uh, you can use these uh, Khan Markovich surfaces um, to build a finite dimensional that will follow from this sort of quasi convexity uh, cube complex. with a proper proper co-compact action. So again, the properness was the issue you had to worry about. Okay, so if you, if you think, so just to give you an idea of a little bit of the properness issue, if you took a, an embedded curve on a surface, right, and you lifted it to the universal cover, you get an embedded thing. Well, what's the cat zero cube complex that you build here? Well, you're just going to build a tree, and in fact, you'll build the bass sair tree, right, associated to this splitting, right? So you get the bass sair tree. This is far from a proper action on this tree, right? There are these big point stabilizers running around. Okay? So, so this is not proper okay so what will make things proper well if you took enough curves on here and then you filled everything up just like we I was talking about over there that will give you uh, a proper act so that's the the work they had to do in using these Khan Markovich surfaces they there are finitely many of them okay that will end up filling uh, the surface, and so the, you build this cube complex. It's a huge cube complex. You can't tell you what dimension it is. This gets back to what we were talking about earlier. You're not taking the three manifolds. It's a very different strategy. You're not taking the three manifold and chopping it up into little cubes. Okay, you're just looking for walls. Okay, so they, so every one of these guys acts on a, properly and co-compactly on a, that's your cube. Filling, yes, exact. That's right. That's right. It's it's a little more, yeah. So you have to define what you mean by filling. Yeah, it has to meet. It has. That's right. It has to meet it in a not in a non-trivial way. It means in the universal cover, you have to see uh, a line that goes from one end to the other of the thing. That's that's right. And so that's this lots of these. Okay, so there's, but you know, there's, again, that's, this is a caricature of the mathematics going on here. This it's a very cartoonish picture also over there, a very cartoonish picture. I'm just trying to give you an idea of uh, the kinds of things that go, go into this. Um, okay, so this is a completely different direction of uses of, cube complexes. So far we've been talking about how you you build cube complexes and some geometric properties of cat zero cube complexes. For example, that there exists, you know, infinite order elements or um, I didn't get into this, but um, you know, you can prove various things about the existence of free subgroups and so on. That's the geometry of it. There's a whole other direction um, which has to do uh, with subgroup separability. So, um, so, um, so a subgroup H of G is separable if uh, for all G and G not equal to one there exists uh, a finite index subgroup K uh, inside G such that G is not in K. So you can, and H is a subgroup of K. Okay, so if you give me um, you know, 
know, some group element, then I'll be able to find a subgroup that's almost the whole group, right? It's finite index subgroup that contains my original guy H, okay, and also doesn't contain G. So you can separate group elements from, from H with finite index subgroups. Um, so, for example, saying that the trivial subgroup is separable is saying that the group is residually finite, right? So, uh, so it's a generalization of residual finiteness, if you like. Now, this, where did this come up? This, this, uh, the motivation for this was three-manifold theory, actually. So uh, people were interested in the question, well, if I have an immersed incompressible surface in a three-manifold, like in this situation, can I find a finite cover where, where it embeds? And this is related to what's called the virtual Hawking conjecture that you're looking for a finite cover of a three manifold where it, which contains an embedded pi one injective surface. That's what you'd like to find. There's a whole history. Again, I won't go into that. So, um, so I think it was originally Peter Scott who came up with this, this way of formulating uh, this algebraically. So if the fundamental group of your surface when mapped inside of M was separable, then you can unwrap the three manifold, one way to think about it, you can unwrap the three manifold without unwrapping the surface. And so the surface ends up being embedded in a, in a finite cover. Uh, that's kind of a, again, very cartoonish kind of picture, but um, anyway, he proved that the, the ability to lift uh, a surface to an embedding in a finite cover is equivalent to this separability condition. So now it becomes something just about groups, right? That's always nice to be able to turn a question, a geometric regression to algebraic question, where right? maybe you can handle it on your own. And so then it became, a, you know, which subgroups are separable? You know, general, general kind of question. Um, so, uh, so there's what's called the profinite uh, topology on a group. So, so you take uh, the basis is the cosets of uh, finite index subgroups. So, uh, saying a group is, okay, so you have to check, exercise, okay, that uh, this is a basis for a topology. Um, and saying, uh, yeah, saying that a group is residually finite is like saying it's Hausdorff in the profinite topology. Um, okay, uh, so let's see, what do I want to tell you about next? Um, right, so uh, there's a notion of a retraction. So uh, G, H, this is a, a retraction, so it's a homomorphism. It's a retraction if R restricted to H uh, is equal to the identity. So it sends every element of H to itself. For example, you can think of uh, a free group and take some factors of the free group, right? So then there's a retraction onto, onto a factor. And you can just send everything, some of, the, some of the generators you'll send to one and all the others you'll leave alone. Okay, so it's the identity on, on H. So. Um, okay, so, so here's a, an exercise. So if uh, H, a subgroup of G, is a retract, so there's a retraction of G onto H, 
and um, g is residually finite, then h is separable. So uh, so the the hint for this is that uh, separable is the same as closed in the profinite topology. Okay, that's the so it's nice to convert this to that. Um, and then uh, a retract of a Hausdorff space is closed. So, okay, a little bit of group theory, a little bit of basic topology, bring you back to your roots, right? I have to think about open sets and closed sets, and okay. So, so the way you you um, um, so I think this was something that uh, Wise was uh, really pushed very hard, is the way you prove subgroups are separable is by proving that they're retracts or proving that they're virtual retracts, which is just as good. Okay, so if you can find a finite index subgroup of G, which retracts onto your subgroup H, which contains H and retracts onto it, then, uh, then you've proven that the group is is separable. Okay, so um, okay, so that'll be the. Oops, I erased the exercise. That's not good. Okay, so um, so the so the goal is to retract. or virtually retract onto uh, the subgroup. So whatever subgroup you hand me, and I'm going to want to prove that it's separable, the way I'm going to do it is by finding a finite cover where there's a retraction onto it. That's the... Okay, so, uh, so then... Uh, very wonderful idea of Stalling's proof of Marshall Hall's theorem. So Marshall Hall uh, proved that um, Marshall Hall theorem um, that if you have a free group Every finitely generated subgroup is virtually a free factor. Okay, so that same idea will end up proving that every. Okay, so 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 the claim is every uh, finitely generated subgroup of a free group. is a virtual retract. Okay, so yeah, Marshall Hall, this was ancient. This is, I don't know, 49B. Um, there's a finite index subgroup that retracts onto it. There's a finite, okay? So, uh, so this is not the way Marshall Hall would have uh, stated it. I don't think that he thought about retracts at all. Okay, but it's the same uh, idea, this, this proof that uh, Stallings gave. Let's see, maybe I'll start this over, start this over here. So uh, we'll do a do a proof by example. That's always good, right? Um, so, so you take a free group. So a free group is uh, 
fundamental group of a wedge of two circles. And you're going to give me a subgroup, right? So, I don't know, we'll take, this is G's, and and you're going to give me two, who wants to give me some words? Uh, a, B, A bar, B squared. Somebody want to give me a word? Sometimes this works, you know, this, and sometimes it's, it gets ugly. Because I didn't even prepare anything. Well, it's just uh, uh, B, A, B, A bar, maybe. It, see, sometimes it's not complicated enough, and then you don't see enough of what's going on. But whatever. Let's just see what happens. So we're going to write this on a, this is your subgroup H that we're going to be interested in. So you write it on this, you know, A, B, uh, A, and then B, B. Okay, did I do that correctly? And then here you're going to write it along here also. So one, two, three, four. So B, A, B, A bar. Okay. And then uh, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, oh, well, what I want to do is I want to get this map. So this is the basic idea. You want to get this map, first of all, to be a local inject, locally injective map. So the first step is to so, so step one is make F this this map from here to here, which represents this subgroup, right? This is map from here to here. Make F locally injective by changing this graph here. So this is a graph gamma. So changing gamma, and this is called folding. So if you you stare at this point here, and you look, it's getting mapped over here. And let me remind you, you've got a B coming out and a B coming in, and an A going out and an A coming in. Well, here you've got, uh, let's say, two A's that are coming out, right? So this map from here to here isn't locally injective because this, right? You've got two A's coming out. I mean, there's four mapping to. Well, no, that doesn't tell you anything. So let's see. So you, uh, so you, what you do is you fold it. Everybody see what I mean? I'm going to take this edge and this edge and fold it and get a theta graph. Okay, so. Okay, everybody, you're going to have to help me because I always get these this wrong. So I folded it, A, and I'm going to continue going this way. So B, uh, a, and then two Bs, right? And then I'm back to this A over here. And now over here I've gone A, and then, oh wait, let's make sure I'm pointing in this direction. B, A, and B. Hmm? Did I do it wrong? Let's see, A, and then I continue with B going in this direction, and then A going in this direction, and then B going in this direction. Wait, I have to put arrows on things before you argue with me, because then I'll get lost. OK, now, who wants to argue with me? Everything's OK? I did it wrong? Who thinks I did it wrong? You do. You think I did it wrong? What about the rest of you? You're not watching? Uh, okay, where is it wrong? Wait, one at a time. 
So let's see. I have A here, then in this guy, then B, then A, then B, and B. B. Okay, right side, A, and then I continue with, uh, oh, I already did it wrong here, right? Oh, so this is B going in this direction. Oh, good. Okay, B, then uh, this is all wrong. This is A, and then this B is, is also the other way. Okay, so I did it all wrong. Great. Now is it right? Okay. Good. Um, notice that what's happened in this situation, if we change this, there's still a map from here to here, right? It's still representing the same subgroup, you know, if you keep track of the base point, so on. Um, if you had more, you would keep folding every time it gets smaller, okay? And so you'll eventually get to some place where it's a locally injective map, okay? Um, Okay, so that, that'll be uh, the first step. So then what you do, uh, so you, the first, the thing that you, so you have, uh, let me draw it again here. Here's our guy AB, and then uh, we've got this theta graph and now I can just um, B, A, B, B, and this was A, right? And then you've got B, uh, A, B. Okay? And, and you've got this nice uh, locally injective uh, map. And the trick is to m complete this to a covering map. So the hardest part about it is drawing it again over here. That turns out to be the hardest part. Because a covering space always has to be above your space, right? So you, that's the hardest part. You just draw it above this, and then it's obvious that you can complete it to a covering space. So that's what we're going to do. You'll, you'll be amazed how this is one of like the most successful stupid tricks that uh, I know of. It's it's amazing thing. A, B. Okay, so you draw it again over here, and you've got this nice map from that's the identity map, and then you you go to some letter, like pick your favorite letter, like A, and look at arcs that are labeled by A. Okay, so. If I built a good example, there'll be some long arc. So, for example, here you've got A. So you, you draw another A to complete it to a circle. Okay? So you do that. And then here you've got three Bs, see? One, two, three Bs in a row. All right? They never go in the opposite direction because we fixed that because of the folding. So you get arcs that are B, 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 and you go up like this. And you complete it to a circle, and you do that for all of these guys. So let's see, A, and I should put letters on them, B, A, A. Uh, I didn't put a letter on this guy, that's a B. So I guess this goes like this, B. And then there's one more A here, right? So A, is that everybody? Good. Well, we're almost done. Um, is this a covering map or is there something missing? What do you think? Looks like... What? So, yeah, so here it's not a covering map, so we're missing... So, okay, so just put a loop there. Okay, so... If in those places where we need to, I think that's the only one here, okay? You add a loop when you label it A, and look, it's a covering map. And there's a retraction from this thing onto the white thing, right? Because every arc 
that you drew here, you can just retract. Right? If it's an arc, you retract it to the path that I had going between the two endpoints. Right? And if it's a loop, I just can collapse it to a point. So there's a retraction. Okay? So this is called completion, canonical completion. This is what Wise calls canonical uh, completion and retraction. Okay, so every subgroup is has a fine there's a finite this a finite cover is a finite index subgroup and there's a retraction onto the subgroup. Right? Isn't that amazing? So uh, you just by drawing some some pictures of uh, some graphs you can uh, prove this theorem. And you should think about now why this also tells you that uh, H is a free factor in this thing. If you think about it, it's also a free factor, just by looking at this picture. Right, so that's the basic trick, okay? That you want to find, it's interesting, sometimes in math, that's the most productive thing, is you want to find a more general setting where the same trick works. The most general setting where this ideal will work. Okay? So, so, uh, so a special uh, cube complex is exactly supposed to be the, the moral, moral definition is it's, the, it's a cat zero, it's a non-positively curved cube complex where this will work. Okay, so a special cube complex is a, uh, uh, a non-positively curved, in fact, I don't think you have to say non-positively curved, cube complex that admits, bless you, a local isometric uh, embedding into a Salvetti complex. So remember we talked at the, in the first lecture about Salvetti complexes, these things that were built out of tori, right, including this very squarish ray, right, uh, to each other. Um, and locally isometric embedding is just like here, you needed a, a map that didn't fold onto itself, so that that's the starting point for, for this completion business, right? So you, you put into the definition the starting point for this completion and retraction thing. Um, right, so this, this definition is, uh, you might wonder how you're you can check it. Well, it turns out that it's the same as conditions involving hyperplanes in a non-positively curved cube complex. I won't list them all, but um, you, you, for instance, are not supposed to have uh, embedded, uh, I mean, the hyperplanes are all supposed to be embedded. So remember I told you in a cat zero cube complex, in a cat zero cube complex, uh, all the hyperplanes are embedded, but in non-positively curved ones, they're not. Okay, um, you should check that in some examples. Like it, maybe your, your squaring of the surface. You should try building hyperplanes in there and pretty soon you'll see they all cross, they cross. But here they're supposed to be embedded. That means it's over or does that mean I have five minutes? Okay, so there are conditions in terms of the hyperplanes of your non-positively curved cube complex that will tell you whether there is such a, an embedding into a Salvetti complex. It's kind of an amazing thing. You just look at the thing and you say all the hyperplanes are embedded and they don't, what's called the oscillate, they don't come back to each other and you can actually check it. If I give you a finite, non-positively curved cube complex, you can check whether or not it's, it's special. Okay, and then 
you want to, when you have a map, I'll, I'll just do a very simple, at the time I have left, a very simple example. Imagine that you had this map, okay, from, okay, so this is a cube complex, just a square and an edge. And it's mapping to, uh, you know, this will be C, A, and B. And here you've got C, and A and B commute. So this is the right-angled group associated to this, right? That's the graph. A and B commute, and C doesn't commute with anybody. Okay, that's a, that's a very simple right-angled Artin group. Okay, well, um, if I want to complete this, I draw it above this, right? That always has to happen. And, it, and then, uh, so this is A, A, B, and B, and this is C, this is C. Okay, well, you start the completion of this by adding arcs like you did before. So here you would add an arc in this direction, this direction, a B, and a B to complete these two loops. And then this would be C, okay? Going in this direction. Okay, well, here you're missing A and B. So you just glue a little torus, and that torus will get mapped to there. And then if you, if you sort of stare at this for a while, it's one of these things where you have to do a few examples before it always works. But, for example, you could have gone like this, and around here, and then here, and then you have to go B in the same direction, so you'll do this. So you glue a square into that. You glue a square into that, right? A, B inverse, A inverse, B. So that's what, that'll get mapped to here. And there'll be, I don't know, another one going like this, A, B, and then you have to go, oh wait, I went like this, and then I have to go in the opposite direction, B, and then there's one that goes all the way around the outside. Okay, so there's four squares that are glued into this thing that complete this to a cover of the torus. Okay, and um, so this is something that uh, Wise and then Haglund and Wise spent quite a bit of time in his understanding uh, when you can canonically complete these things. Okay, so anytime you have a map to one of these Salvetti complexes, then you can separate lots of subgroups. Okay, so in this way you can prove, for example, I mean, I don't have time to go into this, but if you had a hyperbolic uh, guy, a hyperbolic non-positively curved cube complex group, then every quasi-convex subgroup is separable. And you prove it in this very barehanded way. Okay, you, build, uh, you build what's called a core for the uh, quasi-convex subgroup, and then you complete that um, to, and then that gives you a retraction onto that subgroup. So every, every subgroup is, is virtually a retract. So that's kind of an amazing, amazing thing. So it works for every uh, hyperbolic, non-positively curved uh, cube complex. Oh, anyway, that's just a very brief uh, discussion of this. Um, but yeah, there's, so you can go on for hundreds of pages. And, just understanding what you can do with this. Okay, I think uh, I'll finish there. Yes, thank you, speaker. Are there any questions? What are the major, what are the major examples of cubulating groups and uh, vice versa, not cubulating? Yeah, so, um, well, uh, so there are lots of groups that we don't know if they're cubulated or not. Um, so any of all of the groups that uh, don't have property T or, or that have property T, um, those are the ones that we know that don't have cubulations. 
Um, um, and there are other examples, uh, like lattices in SL2 cross SL2, which uh, don't have cubulations, um, even though they, they don't have property T. So that also exists. Um, but there are a lot of groups that, you know, we don't know. Like, for instance, um, uh, you know, so for instance, for mapping class groups, we know that they don't have proper co-compact actions. But we don't know. Maybe they'll have some action without a global fixed point. Um, you know, most, I'd say, most classes of groups outside of uh, three-manifold groups, small cancellation groups, um, braid groups, people started, some of the smaller ones are, can be cubulated. No one knows. So yeah, that's, I don't have a good answer for that. So that's, there's lots to do there in terms of groups that uh, need to be cubulated. Um, Any other questions? If one just abstractly has co-dimension one subgroups, do we have the same yes. kind of, and is any kind of converse true or not at all? There are other yeah, yeah, it's, it's an if and only if. Uh, so if, if you uh, have a group acting on a cat zero cube complex without a global fixed point, then you can find a hyperplane such that the stabilizer of that hyperplane is this co-dimension one subgroup. So yeah, they're, this, they're the same thing. Yeah, so that's, you know, one strategy is, if you, you know, if you have a group that you that you know and love, you can it's, you can either try to build these tracks, like so, and not know what subgroup you're going to get, or you might have natural subgroups that you think, okay, these should be co-dimension one, right? So, uh, so that's uh, yeah, and and then you know, what you, I mean, you, oftentimes you'd like it to be you'd like it to be a finite dimensional. That's very cute. So for yeah, so for for the Gorgia groups, I mean, I don't think that they can't act on finite dimensional ones, right? So you can think about infinite dimensional ones, um, but yeah, then you get a lot less information from the cat zero from this cat zero cubicle structure. Finite dimensional case, you really learn a lot about uh, the group. I, I I only touched on that, but you can get a lot of information about the group. Yeah, the short exact sequence. Both ends you can cubulate. Can you cubulate in the middle? Yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah, we, we don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I've thought about this. Uh, certain exam even just simple examples of this. Uh, so, uh, like, free bicyclic groups were done. Um, and, you know, that was a lot of work. So that was, um, Hagen and Weiss did free bicyclic groups. Yeah, there are groups that you can't. You can't expect that. But you, you know, you'd hope that you can, in, in certain situations when they're, you know, the automorphisms are particularly complicated, then you should be able to. But. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again.